Welcome everybody to our tour of the orchestra presentation um, for this week. We are super excited. Um, we're prepping for our Brahms and Beach concert on Saturday, and I've invited our fourth horn, Lane and Spock, to give a presentation about the repertoire that we're going to be playing on Saturday so that you go into the concert knowing a little bit about the pieces um, and can have a better experience listening to the concert. So without further ado, Lane, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let me first, I need to show my, my PowerPoint. Go. Awesome. Well, I'm very pleased to be back again giving a presentation. Uh, for those of you who were able to join, I gave a presentation last March for the French horn. And uh, as we learned then, it's just the horn, but you know, we'll, that's, you know, if you're curious about that, I'm sure you can go back and, and watch that. But for today, like Sammy said, we're going to be going over the three pieces for, uh, for this Saturday's concert. And it's very interesting because the style of format for performances is a standard um, for professional orchestras and how they perform. You've got an overture from some opera, you have a concerto of some sort, uh, and then you have the second half um, is a large work of some sort, often a symphony. So, and for this concert, that's exactly what we have. Let's see if, there we go. So the very first piece that we'll be performing on Saturday is Hector, oh, too soon, uh, is Hector Berlioz's uh, overture to his Benedict and, uh, sorry, Beatrice and Benedict uh, opera. And this is an interesting work because it's based on Shakespeare's uh, play, Much Ado About Nothing. And Berlioz had a lifelong fascination, maybe obsession with Shakespeare plays. And so this, this piece that he wrote the libretto, he wrote all the words to the opera himself, comes from Shakespeare's play. And for those of you who are not super familiar with uh, Berlioz, he's got the pieces that you may know most are, the big one is Symphony Fantastique, and then maybe his Romeo and Juliet's and then the damnation of Faust. So those are kind of his big three, but he's got these other wonderful, wonderful pieces, um, particularly for brass. I mean, the brass writing for him is incredible. And his style of playing, of writing for, um, for orchestra is massive. Um, his, uh, he has his uh, Requiem, which is a very early work for him and doesn't get very performed very often. And there's probably good reason for that, partly because of how large the orchestra that he's asked for. Um, just the orchestra is asked for 222 members. That's a full-size orchestra plus some, and then four offstage bands. And then he asked for 200 choral members. The premiere was 400, over 400 musicians. So if you can think of our orchestra, Terre Haute, and you know, we have, what, uh, 50, 60, depending on the concert, um, and then timesing that by, you know, five, six times, seven times that. Uh, that's, that's a huge sound. So thinking about Berlioz in this way, um, but then also some of this very delicate playing. Uh, the wind playing for this concert is going to be phenomenal because the pieces are uh, really ask a lot of them. So the this piece has kind of two main melodies that you'll want to listen for. And uh, the first one, you know, it's right at the beginning and you'll get a nice little, and we'll listen to that now. So you get, get a nice hearing of that. Thank you. 
So there we go. So that opening section, you've got this quiet kind of turbulent going on and then bang, this large entrance by you know all the forces, the brass um, sort of leading the way. I'm, I'm a brass player, I'm kind of biased. That's kind of how this goes. Um, but, and then as we move on, we get this much more subtle and passionate melody and I'll play that now. So super long lines, the strings are just singing and you've got this nice coloring with the, wind, uh, with the woodwinds. So, and that, the whole overture kind of goes between these two ideas. Um, and as, as we get to the end, which we'll call the coda, which is kind of like just a tag at the end that goes on, things get a little askewed as it goes along. And that's kind of foreshadowing that in the opera, things don't go quite as expected, which with most comedic operas, that's, that's the funny part. That's the part that you go to enjoy rather than the um, serious drama where it's, you know, someone dies every five minutes. It's like, okay, calm down. This is funny. Let's, let's, let's get the comedic aspects of things. So uh, this will be the uh, opening and the overture. And then we'll move on to the second piece, which is Brahms' uh, double concerto. There we go, maybe, there we go. And with this double concerto, uh, as implied, there are two soloists. So we, uh, it'll be a violin and a cellist, which we're um, very pleased that we're gonna have uh, Natanya and Benjamin Hoffman, we're uh, siblings. And so I'll give a, just a quick uh, overview of their bios. Uh, if, if you're able to join us for the concert, there'll be a much more extensive uh, uh, reading down of what they've done and all the amazing things that uh, I can't, we'd, we'd probably spend the whole time talking about everything that they've done if, if, we did, if I went through everything. But so we'll start with Natanya. And so she is a cellist that performs throughout Europe. Um, she's performed in Russia and in India, China, New Zealand, and in the US. Um, she's performed as a soloist in collaboration with Orchestra Royale, the Chamber de Val Valine. I'm sorry, that's probably very butchered. Um, the Namur Chamber Orchestra, the Symphony, Symphony Orchestra, among some other orchestras as well. Uh, she's also a avid chamber musician and she's a member of the Trio Agora who have two, uh, to this present time, two CDs. The first one is called Youth, which was released in 2017. And the second one is Connecting Identities, which was released in 2020. Uh, she's currently based in Berlin, Germany. And then the second soloist, uh, her brother Benjamin, which from this slide of the, of the uh, headshots, I kind of thought this like dark side, light side, where it's, you know, from just from the pictures. I, I have not had the privilege of meeting them just yet, but, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, they kind of have that kind of feel between them, you know, siblings and whatnot. But, uh, for Benjamin, he's uh, as well performed all across the world. Um, in his bio, he's listed he's performed in Asia, Europe, North America, and then Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I kind of want to be like, when is he going to perform in South America and Africa to, you know, roll out the set of all the continents? I mean, our Antarctica would be fun too, but I don't know how the strings would fare on such cold 
uh, <clears throat> and then uh, he actually has kind of a roots to Terre Haute in that he re uh, received degrees from Indiana University, but then played in the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra from 2009 to 2010 as a section member in the um, violins. And then from 2011 to 2013, he was the associate concert master. So he's, he's coming back to perform with the ensemble um, after a number of years. And then he, after IU, he moved, uh, went on to perform, uh, to get his doctorate at Yale University. He, in terms of his performance uh, background, he's performed as a guest member of the New York Philharmonic, the Baltimore Symphony, and the San Diego Symphony. Uh, and he's also a chamber musician and is a soloist as well. Uh, he is currently based in Los Angeles. So now let's move on to the Brahms, the actual piece itself. So uh, I find this is a very interesting be uh, piece because um, <clears throat> Brahms has four main concertos that he's written, one for violin, two piano concertos, and then he has this double concerto for violin and cello, which at this time was is very unique. There weren't very many pieces being written for two, uh, two soloists. If you go back to uh, the Baroque, that happens much more often, um, but and Brahms is writing in the Romantic era. And so that's um, something that's not very common. Uh, this piece was written in 1887, so it's closer to the end of, uh, of his career. And uh, he had a very close relationship with Josef Joachim, who's a, if you don't know who this uh, person is, he's a fabulous, fabulous um, violinist of that day. You're, you're thinking the, the Perlmans of the world, uh, like the top echelon um, <clears throat> in terms of just performance ability. And Prior to this piece, actually, Brahms and Joachim had a falling out. Uh, they, were, they weren't speaking, they weren't working together. Uh, and then this piece actually was written sort of to kind of bridge that gap between them. And so um, Brahms reached out to Joachim and, uh, and said, hey, I've got this piece going on. And Joachim's like, I've heard your last piece. Let's hear it. I'm, in, I'm interested. And so then um, <clears throat> Joachim and then Joachim was part of a, uh, a string quartet and Robert Hausman, who's the cellist in that quartet, ended up being the other performer for the premiere. Now it's interesting because this, uh, this piece at debut was not received super well. Um, not, it wasn't this, you know, absolute barn burner and everybody just loved it. It took a little bit of time to kind of gain traction um, but it eventually did, and it's performed uh, regularly. Uh, I had, my, last time I was able to hear this piece, I was in uh, Vienna, Austria, and the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra performed it, and it was amazing. Um, so it's, it's great for me, because this is the first time performing it myself, so I'm really excited about that. Um, for the concerto itself, they've got, um, I'll, I'm going to start by playing the opening, and the opening, uh, in terms of some other romantic and maybe classical concertos, you play the opening theme, you go between orchestra and the soloist back and forth. And then at the end of the first movement, you get this cadenza happening. But as we move into more romantic styles of writing, that doesn't happen. And you have cadenzas that start off the piece. And so we're going we're gonna to listen to the very beginning and you'll have this grand opening from the orchestra and it directly dovetails into uh, the cello uh, the cello cadenza so let's take a listen <laughs>
it's really hard to stop because it it's wonderful music. And so I, whenever I was picking the clips that we would listen to, I was like, oh, we'll just add this extra minute and oh, this extra three, four. I was like, I'm running out of time. So uh, <laughs> if you want to hear more, please come to Saturday and it's going to be a wonderful concert. So that first movement, you get these themes that come in with the orchestra and then the soloists kind of pass those back and forth for the remainder of that first movement. Now we go into the second movement, which is historically a more slow music and, um, and movement. And this is no different from that. And so there are two main themes. And the interesting part is that for the first theme, it's octaves between, uh, between the soloists. And uh, it's unique in that usually there's some more counterpoint that happens. Um, and there's more movement, but uh, it but it's beautiful and wonderful. So we'll listen to the opening of the second movement. And so the, the, that, that first theme in the second movement keeps continuing in an octaves. And then we have a slightly different theme, a second theme that uh, there's more counterpoint, there's more movement. So listen to that now. And then that second movement continues. We, we get a reemergence of the um, first theme in octaves. And then we get to this final movement, which is, uh, it's, it's very dance-like. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's mesmerizing, to be honest. And just ha has this uh, very lilt that kind of moves along with it. So we'll take a listen to that. coming in with this grand excite, excitement and uh, continuation of those things. So that, this is uh, an interesting 
work because this is actually Brahms's last work for orchestra. Um, from here until uh, 10, so he still has 10 more years of his life after this, but he ends up um, not writing another piece for orchestra, which if we think about it, we have his first, second, third, and fourth um, symphonies, which are wonderful works. And, uh, and if you wait until the end of this season, we might be playing another one of them. And uh, maybe, you know, so wait for that. Uh, and, um, and so it's like, it's interesting that from here on, we don't actually get any more works with orchestra. Now we'll move on to the last piece. And while it seems like, oh, it's already the last piece. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, this is the large work for the program in terms of the length of it and also the magnitude. Um, I, when doing, doing re my research for this and I recall many classes in which I've taken um, throughout my undergrad and master's and doctorate in which this work has come up. Uh, it is a monumental work for a number of reasons. Uh, and so Amy Beach is a, an American composer. She lived from 1867 to 1944, which uh, I didn't mention the, uh, the dates for the other two composers, but all three composers were alive for two years at the same time. Um, and, but only two years and, you know, Amy Beach would not have met the, at two years old, uh, uh, Hector Berlioz, but, um, and Amy Beach is also the youngest of the three. So uh, the reason why this work is so important is because at this time in the late uh, eight, uh, 19th, uh, 19th century, the US is not yet on the same uh, the global stage uh, as it is after the World War, uh, First World War. And so we don't really have this monumental American ideal of what does American music look like. Even now, we still have that discussion within classical um, composers of what is American music. But uh, Dvorak, uh, Antoine Dvorak, came to the US for three years to teach composition and to help try and foster this, quote, American, unquote, style of music. And his uh, his culmination of that uh, effort is he actually wrote his New World Symphony, which is one of his most popular works. But uh, in that composition, he chose a path of incorporating Native American and then also Negro melodies. Uh, and to be honest, the history, they aren't, he didn't really do a good job of that. And so, um, it's a wonderful piece, don't get me wrong, but in terms of the historical aspect, it's not necessarily the most accurate. Well, Amy Beach coming from an Irish, English, Scottish background um, decided, well, if we're gonna write music for us, I'm gonna write something that's from my heritage. And so she wrote, which is known as the Gaelic Symphony, which is her only symphony. And this incorporates melodies uh, in three of the four war, uh, movements that are original Irish tunes of some sort. Uh, and the other reason why this is an important work is that throughout the 20th century, uh, Americans have a fascination with writing the symphony, the big symphony, where European and other, um, other composers of the world kind of moved on to other forms of writing where as Americans, we stayed focused on symphonic writing. And so uh, Amy Beach's Symphony in E, also known as the Gaelic Symphony, is kind of the one of the first ones that are kind of the pillar of this writing um, for American symphonies. And it's also important because it's the first American female composer to write a symphony. Um, being a full-time musician in the end of the 19th century for Americans was very uncommon. Uh, most uh, most composers had other professions and they dabbled with uh, with um, being a musician or being a composer. And so for um, Amy Beach, she was a wonderful, wonderful pianist. Um, she made her pre premiere with the Boston Symphony Orchestra at the age of 16. And then uh, once she became married, uh, she transitioned um, at the insistence of her husband to 
only one public performance and then also, but so because of that, she moved into writing composition, even though she had a very limited background in counterpoint and um, the fundamentals of writing for, uh, writing for um, orchestra and musicians in general. So uh, this, and I could literally spend an hour or more talking about the history and why this piece is so important, but um, hopefully that gives you a nice overview in terms of, uh, this is a res direct response to uh, Dvorak's uh, New World Symphony. So let's uh, jump in. So the first movement uh, is actually based on a melody from her own work called Dark is the Night, which has uh, Irish implications. And so let's take a quick listen to that piece. So this this uh, this song is actually about this sea voyage that's tumultuous, and you kind of hear this this going along in the piano. Do, 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 do. Keep that in your mind. We're gonna listen to the very beginning of the first movement. I think you'll find some similarities. So I wanted to get to that point because there's an interesting part of this of this first movement that the vast majority of the movement is actually in six eight. So you have this triple da 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 one two three four five six one two three four five six. But the thing is that Beach actually interjects these few measures here and there of two two. So then you go from this one two three one two three one two three one two three to dum dum one and one and one and. So you get this. You go from a subdivision of three to this kind of like jolting to a two abruptly. And at the very end of that section that we just listened to, you have that very distinct bum, 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 which is in that two, two form. That comes back one or two more times throughout with that just one measure. And then actually at the very end of the first movement, we have a section of about uh, 10, I believe, bars, um, give or take of that two, two. And it gives a completely different feel. Um, so whenever you, Get the opportunity to listen to this work hopefully on Saturday. Listen for those those changing of the meter and and how it uh, kind of affects the listening experience. The second movement is based on a melody called the Little Field of Barley, and uh, the the performance that I have to give you a sense of what the uh, of that piece is with actually a fiddle violin, depending on um, who you're asking, uh, I would say fiddle, but, uh, and so just get a quick listen to that.
it makes me think of being out on on uh, pastoral and we're just um, very sweet melodies. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, ornamentation that goes into a lot of these melodies. And so what we'll hear um, from the second movement of the symphony will not be exactly like that, but it's the overall same um, melody. And it we starts the movement starts with a wonderful oboe solo. And so at the end of that oboe solo, it continues. It doesn't stay that sweet. It does continue to kind of grow and have more um, impact, kind of when the brass, you know, us, you know, loud and overbearing brass players come in. But uh, it does uh, return to this sweet melody as well. Let's move on to the next one. There we go. And so then, in a typical symphony, not all symphonies, but typical symphony, we have four movements. And so in this third movement, we actually have two melodies that happen. Um, the first one is uh, Kusha Lamancre, uh, and that is actually Gaelic for lullaby. And then the second one is Which Way Did She Go? And that second is uh, actually, it's a lament for a dead child. So we have a much more um, dichotomy of this lullaby for a child and then the uh, for a lament. Uh, and so what, a, um, I wasn't able to find the source material for this, but we'll listen to both the first melody and then the second melody in, as they're introduced. So the first one is actually introduced by the cello, a solo cello, and then the second is introduced by the violin second, section. It's so hard to stop. It's so hard to stop. There's so many wonderful melodies that happen throughout um, really all of these pieces, but particularly during the beach. And so then we tr uh, transition now into the second melody, which is played by the, the violin section.
we'll stop there with that. Um, and so you've got this very um, somber um, moment from the, from the strings um, for that third movement. Now the fourth movement, as I said previously, the first three movements are all previously composed melodies, Irish melodies of some sort. The fourth movement is actually the first, or the only movement that doesn't have any source material in that um, Beach wrote all the melodies for this, um, uh, new melodies for this. And so there's a quote, that two measure quote, that's taken from the first movement, but otherwise it's, this is all of the uh, melodies that Beach has written. And uh, this, this last movement, we actually rehearsed this last movement last night and boy, is it a doozy. It is wonderful, exciting, quick, and um, it's a lot of fun to perform. Well, so let's listen to uh, the last movement. Another really interesting aspect of this last movement um, is that just like we talked about the first movement in which it is, you feel this triplet, da, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's these interjections of these duples where you feel two instead of three. The exact opposite happens in the last movement. At the very beginning, you'll hear it's um, in two, but Beach interjects these triplet motions to make the music feel that it goes faster and faster, even though technically speaking, it's still the same tempo. Um, and so I don't think that that's an accident. I d definitely think that, that was intentional where the swapping of the, of the meters goes on. Another really great aspect about this symphony is that you pick your favorite, uh, favorite instrument, there's going to be a solo for it. Um, there's, it's wonderful writing in which um, yeah, we heard a clarinet, a flute, um, and a trumpet solo just in that portion. I, I mean, there's a horn and obviously a cello and violin. There's, there's pretty much you like something, you're gonna, you're gonna find it here. And the melodies are just wonderful. Um, and the interesting thing about this piece is that in direct contrast to the Brahms, this was a hit from the very first performance, so much so that it actually was performed three more times in the same season uh, whenever it was premiered. So it, people loved it. And then once, 
But once Beach uh, uh, passed away, the music became a bit more, um, fell out of favor, just people forgot about it. And so it hasn't been until recently, last uh, few decades in which people have been resurrecting her pieces because they're wonderful, they're absolutely wonderful. She is a concerto that is just sublime. Uh, so I, I really hope that you'll be able to join us on Saturday because it's, uh, it's gonna be a really wonderful concert. Are there any questions? Here we go. Michelle, I know, do we have Westminster joining us as well? Yes, we do. Okay. okay. I do have a question here. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Takes, takes a second to kick in. Performers on the YouTube the, for the beach that you played. Did you hear that question? Not uh, quite. I that about the beach, but not specifically. Can you say it again, please? The performers that were on the, the, the clips that you played for yes. the beach? The, so in terms of the symphony? Yes. Uh, so that was a, a recording that was done by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Other questions? comments how many of you have tickets for saturday ah it's full crowd okay i kind of <laughs> figured that um it sounds like it's going to be an amazing concert i'm really disappointed that i don't get to go but um any other questions about the music uh specific to what you're going to see or any other questions about the symphony other performances that are coming up anybody has any questions anybody out online have any questions well, we hope we'll see you guys on Saturday. You know, when I was going to comment, I learned some stuff. I did not realize that the melody from the first movement of the beach came from a vocal piece that she had written a song. That was really interesting to me. Um, and, you know, and I was, as we were listening to the beach and the, and the different movements, and you had the photos of the, the Irish coastline there, it just makes me wish we could, in some form or fashion, do really well done projections or something. Um, we just don't have a way to do that in Tilson right now. For Disney, that'll be very specific to the Disney performance. But um, I tried to do it for our September concert and we just we couldn't figure out how to do it in a professional manner where it looked good. Um, the hall just isn't set up for that, unfortunately. But I loved your pictures. They were perfect. You just watch that coast, you know, while you're listening to the music and it's completely pictorial. It, it really is, particularly that first movement with the with the, the sea voyage um, incorporating yes. things. There, it, you know, the pictures were quite quite nice and everything, but we all know, uh, and hopefully people know that the seas around Ireland and the UK are not uh, necessarily calm all the time. No, no, and rocky. You know, you've got rocky coastlines and and huge cliffs. Um, any other questions or comments? Ah, well, thank you. They're telling me it was a great presentation. So congratulations. <laughs> I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. Yes. Great job, by the way. So um, super happy. And we're going to continue to keep doing these um, Correct. Into, yes. into the winters as well. So Sammy, I don't have my thing right here in front of me. We've got something else coming up. Correct. Yes. Let me, I'm going to put my, my list up here on November. Awesome. Um, we're going to be welcoming uh, Philip Kettler, who, if you guys remember, gave our tour of the orchestra cello uh, presentation several months ago. He is going to be talking about the Baroque cello. So during the time of Bach and Handel, um, the, the string instruments really were just completely different instruments. And um, musicians nowadays specialize in early music and Baroque music. And so he's going to be talking about the differences between the modern string instruments and the Baroque string instruments, um, how they were performed differently, how they were made differently, and then how that affected the music that was written 
Um, so that's happening on November 16th. And then in December, our last one for 2021, um, on December 1st, um, this is going to be kind of a special, interesting presentation. We're actually welcoming our um, one of our resident music theory um, scholars. Her name is Krista Cole. She plays in our second violin section, and she is currently working on a doctorate, a PhD in music theory at Indiana University. And she and one of her colleagues are going to be talking talking about musical forms. So just like uh, writing in, in books, poetry, there's a form. And uh, she's going to introduce the audience to several forms and how to listen for those. No music theory knowledge needed prior to the presentation. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, and then as we get into 2022, Michelle and I are working together to um, uh, schedule at least one. We're going to try to do one presentation a month. Um, Lane is going to come back, I think, in March and talk a little bit about some of his research. And um, he's been uh, 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 engraving scores that he that um, you know original scores with handwritten and, and how that that whole process works. We're going to have our principal harp. She's going to come and do a presentation about the harp and how it works and and the development of that instrument. Um, we're also going to do a presentation on Peter and the Wolf. Our um, English horn, Dr. Jennifer Kirby is going to come and talk about um, how that piece is uh, put together, the composer Prokofiev, um, all the different instruments and what animals and characters they represent in the piece. Um, and then I'm trying to remember our, oh, we'll do a presentation about um, our last concert of the season on April 30th. The presentation will be, I think, on April 27th about um, uh, Rock 2, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, D. Wu will be coming back to perform that. Um, that is also the concert that Lane was alluding to. We'll be playing Brahms's first symphony on that concert as well. And then we're going to play um, resident composer, composer in residence of the Terre Haute Symphony, Dan Powers, who is also the composition professor over at ISU. We'll be playing his overture to the THSO as well. So we love playing local uh, composers. That's really important to us. So it's part of our mission. So those are kind of the presentations we have up through May of 2022. Yes, and, and so that is going to be coming out. And yes, I know everyone is asking me when the winter guide will be out. The winter guide <laughs> is a question. So and right now, the anticipation is I should get them back in my office on the 6th, assuming I make my deadline. And then it's up to the Postal Service to get them out to you. But I am telling everyone, we are going to not wait until everybody gets them before we start putting them in the local areas. So if the post office holds them hostage again, um, you can go to the library and pick one up. You can come to the office and pick one up. Um, basically after the sixth, I will start basically carrying a stack. So when you see me, you can just get one. So that's how we're, we're planning to do that. But it has all those programs that Sammy was just talking about. Um, in addition to just a ridiculous amount of programming that we're doing for winter. Yes. The 17th, it's, it is a Wednesday. No, the 16th is a Tuesday. I don't know, that's what I'm questioning. Okay, let me look. Yep, we are. We're, we did a kind of alternating some Tuesdays, some Wednesdays. So the um, next presentation is on Tuesday, November 16th, with Philip Kettler to talk about Baroque string instruments. Oh, okay. We will have that set and we'll send something out to everybody. Is it? We have it set for the, the, the Wednesday. Oh, okay. Well, I can ask uh, Philip if that's okay. No, that's not right, because we actually what we have set is who's your subversives on the 17th. So let me look. OK, I'm trying to flip through my schedule, but my schedule is so very long. <laughs> yes, I'm pretty sure that it is the 16th. We have it as the 16th. OK, good. Yes, because we had some that were on Wednesdays and some that were on Tuesdays. What happens to be a Tuesday? OK. Well, we will fix it on our end, no matter what, and go from there. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you at next, next Wednesday's presentation.
um, which will actually be at Landsbaum. So that is not a typo when it comes in your email next time, I swear. Um, and it is titled, Know Your Mind, Know Your Body. And that will be at Landsbaum next week. So everybody have a good week. Thank you, everybody. See you on Saturday.